<clears throat> well, good evening. Uh, I want to um, welcome everybody. I trust that you've had a, a good week so far, and, uh, and it's a joy to be able to come together and spend some time in studying God's Word uh, tonight. I want to say that I appreciate the way that our church family has rallied together during this time and done a really good job on uh, on sending out the personal daily devotions to our entire church body um, to be blessed by. It's, uh, it's been really, um, really a, a personal blessing to me. So thank you for that. I look forward to continuing to see our church connect in that way, uh, as well as uh, just through personal outreach to one another. So, um, so thank you. Continue doing that, and, uh, and we'll seek to be a blessing how we can to each other. Um, <clears throat> also, uh, please, uh, please do spend some time reading over the missionary reports that I sent out yesterday. There's a couple of really good ones, and um, just praising the Lord for uh, for some of the uh, victories that have been had in, in some of those ministries, uh, particularly uh, the one in the Philippines with Brother uh, Raleigh Paleo. Uh, it was really just a joy to be able to read his letter. And, uh, and so if you haven't taken the time to do that yet, uh, something that I've missed uh, in being together is being able to read those letters uh, publicly, but Let's make sure that we stay up to date on those and keep praying for our missionaries. Very, very important. So, um, well, we're going to get started on our uh, on our study this evening. And um, again, I'm thankful to be able to uh, to have this time in God's Word. Our our text for the evening is found in Galatians chapter five, uh, specifically in verse thirteen. Galatians chapter five. So, if you'll uh, turn there and follow along in your Bibles, uh, as you know, I love to give the context and the background to scripture. So we're going to start reading actually in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 1. And I'm just going to preach through some of the verses on our way to the text in verse 13. Uh, and I'll get there um, before too long. But Galatians chapter 5 and verse 1 says this, uh, Stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I say unto you, uh, behold, I, Paul, say unto you, that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. Uh, for I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. And just a quick comment, because we're going to see this again throughout the message this evening. Um, the reference to circumcision is a reference to Old Testament Judaism and to the Jewish law itself. Uh, the people at Galatia that Paul was addressing had come to Christ but the, Judea, the Judaizers were trying to pull them back into the law and blend it together with Christ. And so Paul's writing to them and calling them to stand fast in the liberty that's found in Christ alone. And we'll talk more about that, um, but that's why you see the reference to circumcision. Um, verse 4 continues on and says, uh, Christ is become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. Uh, for we through the Spirit... Wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Jesus Christ, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. Uh, ye did run well. Who did hinder you? And, and by the way, um, it's been my observation in ministry that nobody ever backslides from the truth by themselves. Uh, generally, whenever it happens, someone else is always hindering in some way. And so he says... Who did hinder you that ye should not obey the truth? Uh, this persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. I have confidence in you through the Lord that ye will be none otherwise minded. But he that troubleth you shall bear his judgment whosoever he be. Now how many of you get the idea that Paul wasn't happy with whoever was troubling this church? Uh, he said... That guy is going to bear some judgment for this. And he continues on in verse 11, and he says, And I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, uh, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross ceased. I would they were even cut off, which trouble you. Uh, there he goes again. He's not happy with these that are trying to turn them from faithful service to God. Uh, now in verse 13, our text for the evening, For brethren... Ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not occasion, or, excuse me, only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. By love uh, serve one another. 
uh, in this study, we're going to learn how to serve one another. Uh, my goal is to give you the doctrinal basis for it, and I've been trying to do that in each of these studies on Wednesday evenings, and then we'll look at the practical nature of it as well. Uh, let's pray uh, as we begin this study this evening. Uh, Lord, thank you for this wonderful time to open the Bible together. Uh, thank you that we've been called to liberty, as the scripture says. Thank you for the freedom that we find in Christ. I pray that you'll help us to understand what that really means, that you'll help us to serve uh, on the basis of that liberty. We ask that you'll bless this time in your word, uh, bless your church, and keep us close to you. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> well, in the... Uh, in the latter part of the 18th century, during the Revolutionary War, uh, there was a stranger who was riding his horse close to a battlefield when he paused to observe a, a group of exhausted, battle-wearied soldiers that were digging a trench in what appeared to be an important defensive position. The leader of the section, um, though making no effort to help at all, was shouting orders and threatening punishment uh, at those soldiers if the trench wasn't completed within the hour. Uh, the stranger in civilian clothes uh, rode towards the group and he inquired of the leader, why are you not helping? Now, the officer that was in charge looked at the stranger with a contemptuous look and said, I don't have to because I'm in charge. These men do as I tell them, but if you feel so strongly about it, you're welcome to help them yourself. Well, to the officer's surprise, the stranger dismounted from his horse, he removed his coat, and he helped the men until the trench was finished. Uh, before leaving, the stranger congratulated all the men for their work, and he approached the officer again and he said, The next time your rank prevents you from supporting your own men, you should notify command and I will provide a more permanent solution. Uh, the officer looked uh, with a little bit more diligence and very quickly discerned the stranger's face properly for the first time, and he realized in horror that his Perception of the stranger dressed in civilian clothes had been entirely wrong. He hadn't looked very closely at first, and before him, of course, stood General George Washington. Um, with shocked realization, he felt the full impact of a lesson that he would never, ever forget. Well, I, I tell you that story to emphasize a point that I really want us to learn today in, in our study of God's Word together, and that is that God hasn't given you a position of liberty as a Christian so that you can find your way out of serving him, but so that you can find your way into serving him. We're going to see through this study that God has given us a position of liberty for the purpose of service. Now, much of Paul's focus up to this point, as you read through the book of Galatians, has been on teaching the Galatian believers that they were not to seek righteousness or a right standing with God through the Old Testament law. Uh, they weren't to go back into the law as a means of salvation or as their way of pleasing God. And so uh, in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 21, he said this, I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness comes by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. In Galatians 3 and verse 24, he said, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith, but after that faith is come, we're no longer under a schoolmaster. Now, the ceremonial law found in the book of Leviticus wasn't given as a means of salvation, but it was given as a schoolmaster, a, a mentor, to point us to our need for the Savior Jesus Christ and to bring us to a mature understanding of how to please God. Uh, anybody who's ever tried to keep the Ten Commandments would have to honestly say that if I had to keep all of the law in order to be saved, uh, I fall far short of that law. I fall far short of that standard. I can't keep the law. Now, the law wasn't meant to be a way of salvation. It was meant to show us our need for salvation. It was meant to show us our guilt and point us to the way of salvation, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I want you to notice as we come to, um, to our study this evening and we start to put this into some context, um, first of all, the liberty wherein we stand as believers the liberty wherein we stand. Uh, I'll remind you that, uh, that overall our study on Wednesday evenings right now together is for our church body, and, and it's designed to look at a number of the one another commands that are found in the scriptures pertaining to local church members, uh, the way that we're supposed to relate to one another, the way that we're supposed to um, 
uh, recognize in our first study that we're members one of another. Our second study was that we are to love one another. Uh, the study last week was that we were to admonish one another. And now we're looking at serving one another this evening. All right. So the liberty wherein we stand. And again, I want to set the doctrinal basis for this concept, which leads very naturally into the practical nature of it when we get to the end of the study tonight. So in verse one, the liberty wherein we stand, it says, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. Uh, the phrase stand fast uh, means to persist. It means to persevere in something. And Paul's urging the Galatians that they must remain firm and rooted in their confidence in Jesus Christ. Uh, I want to I lay the foundation in this study tonight and say, first of all, that when he speaks of standing fast in liberty, he's speaking, first of all, about a position that we hold in Christ himself. He says, stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. Uh, the concept of liberty means that we're free from bondage. We're free from enslavement. In the biblical sense, it means that we're free from the bondage specifically of sin and that we're saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, you should know Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9 very well. I recommend that all believers commit this to memory. It says this, for by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now when someone is spiritually liberated, they're set free by the grace of God. For by grace are ye saved. Uh, that grace is activated, it's, it's made effective when we receive the Lord Jesus Christ by faith or by believing what the Bible says. When somebody repents, and they trust in Christ as their Savior, they have a new standing in the Lord Jesus Christ. They've literally gone from a position of bondage and sin to liberty in Christ. And God instructs us that he wants us to stand fast, stand firm in our liberty that's found in Christ. Now, if you're listening and you're not saved, uh, I'll say this, that God has a gift for you. Uh, it is a gift of forgiveness of sin but you have to accept and receive it, and when you do, you are free according to the words of Jesus. You're free indeed. Uh, what does it mean to be free? Well, Romans chapter 6 and verse 20 describes it, tells us that by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. No one can be freed that way, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. And so, on one hand, we can say that no one gets their gift of freedom by keeping the law. They get it through trusting the Savior. Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So this freedom entails a new position that one stands in after giving up all their self-efforts and trusting the work of Jesus Christ. Now, what are we free from? Well, the Bible says that we're free from the guilt of sin. Now, Ephesians 1 and verse 7 says, in whom we have redemption, through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. We're free from the penalty of sin. Uh, the Bible says in Romans 8.1, there's therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. And so a person who finds forgiveness of sin in Jesus Christ will never face God's judgment in the fires of hell. No condemnation. He's been set free. He is literally positioned in Christ, with Christ as his covering or as his shield um, that shields him from the judgment of God. God says, stand in that position. It's a position of liberty. It's a position of freedom. Nothing else, literally nothing else can provide it. Once again, consider verse 1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Now, a yoke is a picture of a, a heavy uh, farm instrument that would, um, that would be placed on an ox, uh, a harness, so to speak. And, and that yoke or that harness would be attached to him so that he could pull that heavy plow or whatever the farm implement is that he's attached to. And so when Paul says, he warns us, don't be entangled again with the yoke of bondage, He's warning his readers not to be ensnared, not to be enslaved by this yoke of bondage by being pulled away from liberty and back to what enslaved them before. And now the Judaizers, those that were trying to draw these believers back to Judaism, they were essentially saying, 
Jesus is good, but you still have to follow the Old Testament law. Uh, many have tried. In fact, entire religions like the Seventh-day Adventists have been established by people who want Jesus plus the law as a way to please God. But the message of Galatians is this. Don't be entangled again in that burdensome, heavy yoke. You don't have to keep the ceremonial law of the Jews to be saved. You don't have to eat certain types of food. You don't have to clean your dishes and your clothes in a certain way. You don't have to honor certain holidays to please the Lord. There's liberty from all of that. When the believers in Galatia trusted in Christ, uh, they lost and threw off the yoke of servitude to sin, and they put on the yoke of Christ. Servitude to sin was set aside. Now they serve Christ. Uh, the yoke of works is hard. The yoke of, uh, of producing self-righteousness to be pleasing to God is hard and the burden is heavy. Christ's yoke is easy and his burden is light. The yoke of Christ frees us to fulfill his will while the yoke of the law just hopelessly and pointlessly enslaves us. And so the stand of liberty is a stand in a position in Christ. It positions us there. Secondly, it's also a position of grace or a position in grace. Uh, in verse 2 of our, uh, of our study tonight, Galatians chapter 5, Behold, I, Paul, say unto you, that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. In other words, no works are required. Um, you don't have to work to have a standing with God. You don't personally have to. Galatians 2 and verse 16 tells us, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. Uh, many religions say that you have to do all these different works to have the acceptance of God. And Paul says, no, it's not by the works of the law. In fact, uh, the law would demand that it must be completely fulfilled or it's not fulfilled at all. Verse 3 of our text says, For I testify again to every man that is circumcised, that he is a debtor, notice that phrase, um, to do the whole law. In other words, if you're going to please God by doing the law, God, the, the law is God's standard of perfection, of righteousness. If you're going to please God by doing the law, you've got to keep the whole law with absolute perfection. And so either you meet the standard of righteousness perfectly, or you don't meet it at all. James chapter 2 and verse 10 says, Whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point... He is guilty of all. Uh, we learn in the Bible that salvation is either all of Jesus or it's all by the law. Uh, there is no hybrid faith that's taught in the Bible. It's either all of Jesus or all of the law. So you can't trust in Christ and trust in your ability to, to do good works at the same time in order to be saved. It's not possible. Verse 4 of our text, um, Galatians 5 and verse 4 says, Christ is become of no effect unto you, whosoever of you are, are justified by the law. Ye are fallen from grace. Now, the phrase fallen from grace is not saying that someone could lose their salvation. It doesn't mean you were saved and now you're not saved. It means that you are making grace powerless or unable to accomplish its purpose because you're trusting something else. You have to recognize the importance of grace alone. And to keep some obligatory laws to try and be right with God is to disregard God's grace and trample on it. You see, friends, um, grace, by definition, is undeserved favor. If God saves you by his grace, it's not something that you earn. It is a free gift that's given. And because of that, those that are saved have a position of grace that's given to them by God. Once you're in the position of grace and you're standing in the freedom of Christ then you can never fall from grace in the sense of losing salvation, but you can fail to appreciate its power if you turn to something else, if you turn back to something else. Jesus said in John 10 and verse 28, I give unto them eternal life. Those that are saved, I give unto them eternal life. He's the only one who can do that. Uh, no church can give eternal life. He said, I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. Now, I don't know about you, but I am so, so thankful for that promise. 
No one is able to pluck me out of the Father's hand, <laughs> not even me. So the phrase fallen from grace doesn't speak of losing your salvation, but it does speak of denying the life-changing power of the grace of God. There is no hybrid salvation. It's either grace or it's works. It's either all of Christ or it's none of Christ. And so when a man or a woman is standing in this position of liberty, they stand positionally in Christ, and they also stand in a position of grace. And third, they stand in a position of hope. In verse 5, For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. When a man is no longer trying to save himself and he's simply trusting God's grace, he's in a position of hope, specifically hoping for that day when he sees the Lord Jesus Christ with his own eyes. God says, stand fast in your liberty. Why? Why do we stand fast in it? Philippians 1.6 tells us the reason of our hope. It says, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Christ. And so uh, that would be the day that Christ returns uh, for his saints. And so the believer has the confidence that God has made him righteous in Christ, that one day he will see the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, this is the position of liberty in which a believer stands. Now, stay with me because I'm going somewhere with this. Um, if you are saved, you have a God-given position. You're set apart from the old ways. You've been justified by Christ. You've been set free from the guilt of sin. You've been set free from the burden of sin. You've been set free from trying to work your way into God's favor by your own personal righteousness. You're saved by God's grace. Now, Honestly, I could stop right here, and we would have had a great Bible study already. Uh, I'm just so glad that I'm saved, and I hope that you are as well. Uh, so this is the position of a believer. Uh, next, I don't just want you to see the stand of liberty, but secondly, note uh, the subversion of liberty that's spoken of in this chapter, the subversion of liberty. Um, there were two attacks on liberty that we've spoken of in the first century, and they continue to this very day. I've seen them over the years many times. Satan has used them very effectively in the lives of some believers that I've personally known. Uh, the two attacks can be identified as what's called legalism and another term called license. And we'll see just very briefly how the devil tries to pull people away from the simplicity that's found in Jesus Christ. So first of all, let's talk about legalism. Verse 6 says this, For in, Christ, in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. Ye did run well. Who did hinder you that ye should not obey the truth? Now, uh, the truth is represented in the gift that we already talked about. Jesus paid it all. All to him we owe. We're saved by grace. We're standing in grace. This is the simplicity that's found in Jesus Christ. Satan, though, wants to hinder us and take us away from the simplicity of Christ. Uh, he wants to bring us into bondage again, and that was the very problem they were facing in Galatia. The Judaizers were bringing people into bondage to legalism. Let me quickly define legalism for you. Maybe you don't know exactly what that means. Well, first of all, legalism adds self-effort to faith in Christ to try to gain salvation. In the strictest definition, legalism is when we add anything to the cross of Christ. That becomes legalism. We're adding our efforts and we're saying, hey, you've got to have Jesus but you've got to do these other things as well. That's what they were doing in Galatians chapter 5. You've got to have Jesus, you've got to be circumcised and keep the law as well. So it, it becomes a form of works. Now, if you simply read the New Testament, you'll clearly see that we don't get saved by being baptized. We don't get saved by attending church or by being a church member or by being a good neighbor. We're saved by the payment of Jesus Christ alone. But legalism always wants to add to the gospel. And so we're defining legalism. It adds self-effort to faith in Christ. And then uh, another feature of legalism is that it emphasizes rules rather than a relationship with Christ. Here's what happens uh, in these cases, or what tends to happen. People look right outwardly, and often they live right outwardly, and they know very well how to find fault in everybody else. 
But suddenly you hear that the man left his wife, or the wife left her husband, or the man fell into some other form of sin, and everything outwardly looked great. But it was all pretend, it was all self-righteousness, and there was no substance at all under the surface. What we have to discern is that outward rule-keeping doesn't always mean that the heart is really right with God. I hope you understand that today. That's the danger, and that is the tragedy of legalistic living. People can learn very well how to play the part outwardly, without truly loving the Lord with all their heart. And it almost always ends in utter collapse. You see, um, genuine repentance will bring a sure knowledge that there's nothing we can bring to Christ except corruption. I can only bring my sin to him, and that's why I have to cast myself completely on his grace and on his mercy for salvation. Now, let me emphasize that once you're saved, um, doing good works, living out a righteous life, and having biblical guidelines and standards for your life is not legalism. <laughs> That's just Christian living. It's called, in Romans chapter 12, your reasonable service as a believer. Now, sometimes people say things like, well, everybody's on me all the time about attending church, or the pastor's preaching this really hard stuff from the Bible, or my teacher's laying some really tough challenges out, or... Uh, we're being told that, that to please God we have to tithe and even give offerings to missionaries and other causes. Or I'm being told that I ought to dress a certain way or talk a certain way or only go to certain places or only have certain kinds of friends. Listen, doing those works for the Lord as a believer is one of the reasons that God saved us. And we'll see that in just a minute. I read Ephesians 2 verses 8 and 9 earlier which says we're saved by the gracious gift of God and not of our works. That's what brings us into a relationship with him. It is through faith in the work of Jesus Christ. But the very next verse explains that God's creation or his workmanship in us to make us a new creature leads us to serve him after we're saved since God has a purpose for our lives. And so doing good works is not legalism. But emphasizing those things over the person that we worship, that can become very legalistic. It, it becomes just about doing things and no longer about Jesus Christ. Titus chapter 3 and verse 8 tells us, this is a faithful saying, And these things I will that thou constantly affirm, that they which have believed in God, right, they're already saved, might be careful to maintain good works. And so, living a life of works for Jesus as a believer is not legalism. But when I'm emphasizing and I'm glorying in my works, that's a self-righteous spirit, and Jesus Christ is not glorified when that spirit comes into our lives. So, here is the hindrance of legalism. Remember, Paul said, who did hinder you? You were saved by grace. Who did hinder you? The phrase hinder, uh, or the word hinder, it means to change course. And we see the, the, the real hurt of legalism in verse 8. Paul says, this persuasion, or this idea, cometh not of him that calleth you. In other words, when someone's trying to tell you that a Christian, the Christian life is simply about a list of rules, and they're not teaching you to exalt Jesus Christ in your life as the motive behind your way of living, it's going to hurt you if you get your focus off of Jesus Christ. Well, Paul challenges them to stand fast in their liberty. In the first century, the idea was to gain your salvation by adding works. That was the concept of legalism. There's still plenty of that around in different denominations today where, where uh, these religious organizations will say you have to do all these things plus Jesus. Another modern-day context of legalism would be um, doing a lot of outward uh, works to gain a reputation or to have some motive to be holier or better than everybody else out of self-righteousness. Either way, legalism is a subversive pull away from the simplicity of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, we come to our text, and I want to show you the second pull away from the simplicity that's found in Christ in verse 13. It says, For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh. 
And so here we see the opposite of legalism, and that's what we call license. License. Now we're talking about, uh, we talked first of all about the, the liberty in which we stand. Now we're talking about the subversion of liberty, and there's two ways that it's subverted or overthrown. One is through legalism. The second one is through license, and this is the abuse of liberty. This is the Christian that says, you know, salvation isn't based on my works, so I'm free to live however I want to. I can party, I can drink, I don't have to have any standards, I can do whatever I want to do. The Bible says, use not your liberty as an occasion to the flesh. Now let me just pause and say that this mentality is where the majority of so-called Christians are today in America. They like to kick at people who have any standards. In fact, they like to talk about anyone who is zealous or faithful for the Lord and just paint with a broad brush, yeah, they're legalists. Now that may or may not be true. As I said, there is legalism in some churches, but the great problem in America today is not legalism. The great problem in America today in churches is those who claim to be Christians who are given to this idea of license and they're dismissive about following the commands of God's word in obedience, in sanctification, in holiness. Uh, many churches are greatly weakened due to their improper beliefs about liberty and grace. This type of mentality will begin in small areas, but like a cancer, it'll eat away and it'll lead them completely away from Christ and his service because this brand of license has convinced them that I can live how I want, I can do what I want, I can go where I want because I'm under liberty. Nobody can tell me what to do. They may not even overtly think those things, but that will be the fruit of their lives if they go down this path. Now, this is a subversive pull or temptation on believers who are supposed to stand in the liberty that's found in Jesus Christ. Once again, verse 13 says, For brethren, ye have been called to liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion, that is a base of operations or an excuse, to the flesh. Paul says not to let your freedom that you find in Jesus Christ be the launching point to bring you right back to sinful activities and lifestyles. Now, there's a great analogy of this in our own American culture. Without a doubt, the highest form of government that the world has ever, ever known is a Republican form of government that our nation has enjoyed over the past 250 years. The liberties that accompany that form of government are unmatched in this world's history. But those liberties are only good as long as they are undergirded and supported by truth. Truth serves as the guide and the guardrails to make sure that those liberties aren't abused for the wrong purposes by wicked people. But once the truth is unhinged from those liberties, the guardrails come off, the, the um, undergirding of absolute truth, which would be the word of God and biblical principles, once that's taken away, then all that's left is for the wild imaginations of man's heart to abuse those liberties that brings large-scale degeneracy into the culture, and, and ensuing immorality crumbles the culture like a cancer as the sanctity of life and all the laws just crumble and fall away. And then people just live purely for self, with no care for anyone and no care for anything but themselves. Anarchy rules on an individual level, um, ultimately on a national level as well. God's people have been given unimaginable liberty once they're saved. But that liberty is guided only by the principles of God's word. When the word of God is cast aside, catastrophe ensues as the selfish and sinful imaginations of the human heart just run amok. Now this concept of using, um, or more appropriately abusing liberty, is referred to as antinomianism. That just means against law. It's much like libertarianism in politics today where all government and all legal authority is just rejected and people set themselves up as their own authority. People say things uh, in religious circles like this. Just give me Jesus. I don't want to hear anything else in the Bible. Jesus is the only thing that's important. 
You know, John chapter 1 and verse 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now listen very carefully. Every time I preach an expository message through the verses of Scripture, I'm giving you Jesus because he is the Word of God. Now some people say, oh, well, I don't want to hear those commandments. I don't want to hear the do's and the don'ts. I don't want to hear about any kind of standards. I just want to love Jesus and I want to enjoy my freedom. The fact of the matter is that while we must love Jesus and we must always be motivated by our love of Jesus, we can't be pulled into a lifestyle of license. We always have to obey him if we truly love him. In John 14, 21, Jesus himself said this, He that hath my, hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. Uh, by inference then, if you won't keep his commands, you really don't love him. Romans chapter 6 says it this way, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Now, um, why are people baptized after they're saved? If you've been baptized, uh, scripturally baptized, you identified with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 6 says that you were buried in the likeness of his death, raised in the likeness of his resurrection. Uh, that pictures faith in the gospel, but it especially pictures death to the old life, the old sinful ways that you used to live, and resurrection to the new life that God expects you to live now. And so he says, how shall you, being dead to sin and identifying with Christ, how shall you continue, continue in sin? Should we continue in sin? God forbid. Uh, that lifestyle is not a biblical lifestyle. It's not a Christian lifestyle. It's living for the flesh which is supposedly overcome by Jesus when you trust in him. Romans chapter 8 and verse 5 says, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit mind the things of the Spirit. You see, every saved person still has that fleshly nature. There's temptations and trials that come for all of us on a constant basis. But in Galatians 5.16 it says, this I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. That's the answer. But today, many people lightly call themselves Christians, and they still say, I can do whatever I want. Now, a person may be saved and do some terribly shameful things and still go to heaven because of the gracious gift of God's salvation. That's something that's never lost once it's received. But the purpose of God's grace is not so any person can go back to the way of the world that it took the precious blood of Jesus Christ to save them from in the first place. Shall we continue in sin? God forbid. Now, my, my point is this. God gives us liberty. He gives us freedom from the bondage of sin. He gives us freedom from the guilt of sin. He gives us hope. He doesn't give us this liberty so that we can confound that liberty by going back into the law. And God also doesn't give us liberty so that we can confound it and destroy our testimony by going into license. And that brings me to this final point, which is really where we've been heading all along. And that is the service of liberty. The service of liberty. What do we do with the freedom that God graciously gives us? Uh, well, freedom is not an opportunity for self or for sin. Freedom is an opportunity for service. That's what I want you to see through all of this. Verse 13, once again, For brethren, you've been called unto liberty. Only use not your liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. Uh, there's our one another statement that's in this scripture. This is... Uh, this is uh, specifically, I want to remind you for church ministry, church members, and their, re their relationship with one another. In legalism, I'm serving self because it makes me look better and makes someone else look worse. In license, I'm serving sin because I'm going back to the ways before I was saved. God says, I don't want you to serve self and I don't want you to serve sin. Now that you're free, I want you to take that freedom and I want you to serve others. You know what I've noticed? I've never had a teacher or a preacher or another worker in church ministry who ever wanted to argue about being free to live however they want to live. You know why? It's because they're too busy 
doing eternally profitable things to have silly arguments about things that are going to please their flesh. They don't have time for it. Now, people that are mature in the Lord are too busy serving to worry about all that nonsense. And so what is this service? Well, it's a service of love, first and foremost. A service of love, and it is a service of love first for the Lord. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 14, For the love of Christ constraineth us. That means it motivates us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. A mature Christian does the math, and he says, If Jesus died for everyone, and then all of us, including me, need salvation, or needed salvation, we were all spiritually dead. If Jesus Christ did that for me, then I don't care about what I can do for myself. If Jesus did that for me, what can I do for him? The love of Christ constrains me. I love him because he first loved me. Now, listen very carefully. The origin of what you do, the motivation of what you do, is far more important than what you do. <laughs> and so I ask you this question. Why do you do what you do? I pray that your motive for everything that you do in ministry is because of your love for Jesus Christ. And when people look at our church and things are running ship shape like they should be, they shouldn't just get the impression that uh, these people do all that stuff because Pastor Phil really cracks the whip on them. It should shine through very clearly that uh, these are people who are in love with Jesus Christ. And no matter how long they've been Christians, the honeymoon hasn't worn off for them. And the motive for their ministry is purely a love for Jesus and not just a list of do's and don'ts to please a person. You see, uh, for the person who really loves Jesus, fear of violating a law or breaking a rule isn't ever a viable motivation. The motivation is love for the Lord Jesus Christ. The love of Christ constraineth us. That leads then to a love for one another. Mark chapter 12 and verse 30 says, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. Well, that's what we just talked about, being motivated out of love for the Lord. And then Jesus goes on, he says, And the second great law is like. Namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. Now, I just want to tell you something today. When you fall in love with Jesus, you're going to want to love and serve other people because Jesus said, as the Father has sent me, even so send I you. It is a service of love, and it's a service for others. Jesus went on to say, for even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, that is, he didn't come to be served himself, but to give his life a ransom for many, to give himself away in service. Wherever real Christianity has abounded through the centuries, this service that I'm talking about is very, very evident. One author put it this way, uh, doing, uh, doing a look back at uh, at history of true believers through the centuries. He said, for centuries, Christians have been the primary agents of charity and compassion in Western culture. From the first century forward to the founding of the American colonies, Christians are the ones who took the lead in caring for the hungry, the dispossessed, and the afflicted. Uh, this was, in fact, the hallmark of authentic Christianity to the world. Now, I'm not just talking about social gospel type of ministry like that writer was talking about. This instruction, by love, serve one another. You, Christ has liberated you. He's given you all this freedom. You utilize that freedom, not for yourself, but to serve one another by love. That instruction is given to churches in the New Testament. Now, this is how a church body is supposed to function. Intense love for one another and intense service to one another. When this type of ministry is taking place through people who are freed from sin by Jesus Christ and who understand then the purpose of their freedom, entire communities learn about the Savior through the ministry of that church. When people really understand their freedom from sin, people surrender their lives to be teachers and preachers. They surrender their lives to be missionaries, and those missionaries are sent as hearts are captivated by love and service for Jesus Christ. When liberty is understood, it's no longer about self. It's about a mature service for the Lord Jesus Christ. And all those silly, 
selfish, sinful, immature behaviors are put to rest once and for all in a church body. God's children get serious about their responsibility to serve within the church body, and the conflicts go away as members humble themselves as servants before one another. Now, there are some tremendous needs in our church. There are tremendous needs for service in our community. Someone's got to use their liberty not to do what they want, but to do what Christ wants of their life. Now, catch it quickly. God's given us a new standing in Christ. That standing is being free from guilt and free from the penalty of sin. Yet we see this subversive pull away from Christ as Satan always tries to throw his wicked snares out there. He's trying to pull people away to legalistic living, establishing rules rather than relationship with Jesus Christ, or the pull to license to just live how they want to. And then we see uh, the service that God has called all of us really to do. And so there's three kinds of people who claim to be Christians today. Hear me. First, there's the Pharisaical who either says, I'll add my works to Christ and be good enough, or eh, I do more than you do, so I'm better than you are. That's the exact opposite of what the gospel message teaches. Second type of person is the self-centered and self-serving brat who says, I can do whatever I want. Let the good times roll. Give me some Burger King Christianity. I want Christianity. I just want it my way. And then there's the Christian, the true Christian, who says, God has freed me so that I can serve. I will not use my liberty for self or for sin. God forbid. I want to use my liberty to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. A mature believer is motivated by grace to serve others, not to promote self and not to live a life of sin. And so our challenge today as a church body is this. Stand fast in the freedom that God has granted you in Jesus Christ. Don't use your freedom as an occasion to please your flesh, but by love, serve one another. Now, somebody may be listening to this and has realized, I don't know if I'm free. I don't know if my sins are forgiven. I don't know if I'm really standing in Christ. I look at the fruit of my life, and, uh, and it's nothing but sin. I don't know if my sin's been washed away or that if I died today that I would go to heaven. Well, I say to you this, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. This gift has been paid for by Jesus Christ in his sacrifice on the cross. You can receive it. And I want to invite you to finally bow before Jesus Christ and ask him to forgive your sins and save your soul. If you've never done that, then today should be that day. And if you're listening today and you're already saved, are you using the liberty that God has graciously blessed you with to serve others or for selfish things? May God use this message to draw the members of True North Baptist Church together by love to serve one another. Let's bow in prayer and we'll, and we'll close. Our Father in heaven, I thank you from the bottom of my heart for the incredible salvation that's been provided to me through Jesus Christ. And thank you that you've saved me and given me liberty from the horrors of sin, from, uh, from the, the certain doom that was spelled for my existence in hell. Thank you so much for your forgiveness. I thank you for bringing me to a clear understanding of repentance and of what the Savior's done for me so that I could be freed. I pray, uh, I plead, Lord, that, and that for myself and for the members of our church, that we would not be uh, drawn away, that we would not be subverted uh, by anything from our love for Jesus Christ and the primary reality that we are to have a relationship and a walk with him. And our love for him should then motivate us to serve him and to serve one another. And I pray that as this mature understanding comes through your word in this study uh, and through the, the rest of your word as well as a common theme, that you would impact our hearts. Uh, it is our prayer that our study right here and right now will not have just been an exercise in futility, but that lives would truly be changed, strengthened, and matured through it. Thank you for your love. I thank you for our church. How I thank you for each member. I pray for your care and your protection upon each one of them. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, I love you folks. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be able to.
together tonight, and I pray for God's blessing on you as this week continues.